The uh, trial of uh, Chauvin has been delayed or put on hold because the uh, apparently the defense has won some time uh, to additionally prepare now that the third degree charge has been added to the accusations that was anticipated. So jury selection has paused. Uh, apparently that has not stopped the gathering of uh, as many as uh, hundreds of people downtown. We are equipped throughout the trial to constantly touch base with a couple of people, uh, one of whom is going to be who's ever representing Channel 5 TV down there with the camera, uh, and the other is a fellow who works at Ground Zero, a GLer who has volunteered uh, to check in with us when we need him, and we're going to do that. But uh, today, uh, today would be... There's no reason to really check in with anybody because nothing right. is happening. Nothing is happening yeah. today. Eric, is it Shalom? I, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Yeah. Yeah. Weekend yeah. anchor. Yeah. Um, he said he's willing to come on whenever we need him. Oh, good. So Well, we'll, we'll go to wh whoever we need on a daily basis if we need to. But again, today, fortunately, there's no disruptions. There's no problem. I did read the jury questionnaire that was sent to me by a couple of people. Oh. And... Uh, uh, unless you can get this guy to Mars and have a trial, I, I don't, I don't see how there can be any outcome other than the anticipated outcome. I was reading this morning that one of the questions was, "Have you ever been strangled by a police officer?" Is that right? I did not see that one. Yeah, okay. you can look them up yourself. Here, I'll tell you how to do it. Uh oh. W, you could, w, w, no, you, well, well you can do it. No, I'm very serious. I'm very serious. You, GLers might want to read, might want to read this jury questionnaire. And uh, oh, great! I think I deleted it. Well, and it's never you can never retrieve it again. Damn it! God, never to be seen yep. again. Oh, oh wait, here, oh, there, here, here it is. Okay, the trash here, here it is. Here we go. Uh, www. Oh my God! Sure. Dot. M and courts, one word, min courts, dot gov slash <laughs> min courts gov mm -hmm. slash media uh, slash high profile cases. Or I'll just post this to the Garage Logic Facebook page and people can see it uh, and on our that? social media oh. channels. Here I found the question I saw this morning, Joe. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this is courtesy of the New York Times. They published the entire, th th there's, a, there's a number of questions on here, but this uh, is part three labeled police contacts. Question number eight under that category. Have you ever been restrained or put in a chokehold, for example, by law enforcement or during a self-defense class? Yes or no? If yes, please explain. That was the question I was referring who to. Was, who was the wrestler who put the sleeper hold on people? That's the Vern Gagne. No, no. There was somebody else that was it. The claw, but the claw did the. Uh, he did the claw. Baron von well, Raschke did the claw. Well, it was either Vern or Baron. I was writing something about something about them maybe, and they did that to me. They they gave me the sleeper hold. What it does, it's it cuts off the blood in your carotid arteries. Nice. I, I it was horrible. It was horrible. Yeah, I mean, you I'm probably fine. Probably deserved it though. Yeah, it shuts you up for a while, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Rook found it. Is this, I think we have audio of it in during a match. Ray! Do the hammer lock. Yeah, wasn't it the hammer lock? It was the hammer yeah. lock. I do the hammer lock. Turkey necks. What was the backing yeah. band for that, I wonder? One of the local garage groups. Was that the episode where you basically just mentioned? His passing, yes. During the top of the hour, yes. you spent the whole show it was taking one of my calls favorite shows. One we, of my uh, favorite it, shows. we did. It, it spilled over to the next day as well. Yeah. Wow! Because people were, and Joe said, during the, sh I just mentioned that he died, and all these Reggie Lazarski uh, fans came out of the woodwork. It was great. Boy, and we discovered backing up to the pay window. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> Kenny, you're wrong. You should listen to it. He, uh, it, it, he was. Wrong. He was really a sweet, sweet human being. I was well, there, Joe. Out. Yeah, oh, I remember yeah. it well. Just a sweet guy. Jeez. Well, I'm going through this entire questionnaire, which is 
I'm on page, it's 16 pages long. Right, right. But like you said, how are they going to find anybody that doesn't have a, an well, opinion the, on this? The, the general dynamic of it is, uh, are you aware of this guy? Well, well, who isn't? <laughs> right. And if you, if you aren't aware, do you want that person on your jury? Yeah. Yes, you do. That's who you want. Well, I know. But, exactly. But, but what I'm saying is that person is so out of it that how do you not? That's, it's, it's, it's the other end of the spectrum. Who is this person that doesn't know about this? A shooting occurred in at 38th and Chicago, injuring one and killing one. Saturday, sometime after the dinner hour. Uh, for some reason, the reporting of that did not make the print editions of either the St. Paul Sunday Pioneer Press or the Minneapolis Sunday Star Tribune. It did, however, make the website stories in both the St. Paul Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune. I personally think it's the biggest story, and it's so connected to the trial, but it, it's the biggest story we've seen in the last year. The police, and it's very interesting the way this was covered, in both the Minneapolis and St. Paul online versions yesterday, both papers reported that the police, according to a news release from the police department, when officers arrived at the shooting scene, they were, quote, met with interference, close quote, hmm. which is a polite way of saying they weren't wanted there by the highwaymen and women who, who run that intersection as a lawless autonomous zone. In today's print editions, we get the story. And the St. Paul paper uh, was faithful to its online version story yesterday, and we learned that, yes, in the St. Paul version of the story, uh, police were met with interference. The Star Tribune uh, went a long distance away from their online story. And today, on page A5, the incident at this so-called George Floyd Square is only part of a roundup of three weekend shootings in Minneapolis. Uh, one man was killed and two men injured in three weekend shootings. Uh, the homicide happened close to the scene of George Floyd's death nearly a year ago at the intersection of 38th and Chicago. The man died at Hennepin County Medical Center after the shooting around 5.45 p.m. Saturday. Again, that's so early in the evening, I'm wondering why that didn't make the print editions of the Sunday papers. Uh, authorities did not release the victim's identity, but friends and colleagues identified him as Imez Wright, 30 of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And we get, and then we go on to hear that, that Wright worked for Change, Inc., a Twin Cities organization where he was part of a team of 10 social service staffers who mentor black youth in St. Paul. The Ramsey County program is funded by the State Department of Human Services. He was training to be a mental health uh, practitioner. It is a huge loss for our organization and our team, said Quentin Bonds, one of the supervisors. Our team is like family. We lost a family member. Mm -hmm. Wright had a tempestuous youth with a long list of petty offenses, many of them traffic incidents. He also had a conviction for domestic abuse and another for the sale of narcotics in 2012. Bond said that Wright told him that he wanted to help steer young people in the right direction. He always said he wishes he would have known better. Bond said he was very authentic. Uh, Steve Floyd, one of Wright's supervisors and co-founder of the Agape Movement, a community protection program for the George Floyd Square area, said Wright was passionate about changing his life. Uh, police, a uh, few details on the shooting were available. Uh, police spokesman John Elder said initial findings indicate that the victim and a suspect had been arguing. After the shooting, the suspect fled in a light-colored suburban that was struck by gunfire. And that's the end of the George Floyd reporting. We get no mention in this roundup of shootings in today's print version of the Star Tribune that the police were met with interference. It seems to be taken as an acceptance. Hmm. 
Well, it sounds like this guy, this this victim, you know, how the, there's the cliche when somebody we lose. Oh, he was just trying to turn his life around. Mm -hmm. This guy from 2012, it sounds like he did. He had turned his life around. But this is what the citizens are faced with here is half the story. Oh, yeah. It's half the story. I know now more than I ever uh, realized I would know about the fellow who was murdered Saturday, but the police have few details. So why am I being given this glowing account of this fellow's troubled life that he apparently is in the process of turning around? I'm given half the story. The police are not allowed to give me the other half of the story. Yeah, that's bad. And then in today's Pioneer Press Online, let me get to that because you'll find this interesting. Uh, uh, in today's Pioneer Press Online story of this, which I'll scroll down to because I need to get her name correctly. Uh, just hang with me. A man fatally shot at George Floyd Square Saturday night. And I click on that story and we get a beautiful color photo of a woman uh, by by beautiful, I mean it's a very colorful photo. Okay. We get a we get a photograph of a woman named Eliza Wesley, known to the community as the gatekeeper of George Floyd Square. The gate. We've got a gatekeeper. There's a gatekeeper, like a, to a castle. Now, <laughs> no, meaning she makes the decision as to who I, comes in and who doesn't. I, I I think that's a reasonable suspicion. Or she calls for backup if uh, we've got some uh, uh, police officers here and we don't know why they're here. You need to come to the front gate. Is she the same one that issued out the list of demands? That I don't know. I wish somebody researched that for me really quickly. Uh, Rook, uh, list of demands given to Mayor Fry from 38th in Chicago. Got it. See if you can find it. Uh, I do not think it was this Eliza Wesley who apparently is the gatekeeper. Uh, people, uh, this is insanity. This is madness. It, it's one thing to uh, block an intersection and, and pretend it's a sacred site and have powwow fires and burn pits and have your community meetings and pray for justice. That's, that's all one thing. But you're killing people here. And you're not involving the police. Not you. Not you. I don't know who killed him. But his shooting, his shooting death arose from whatever was taking place inside that autonomous zone. And no police. Police apparently are more than willing uh, to acquiesce to the, uh, the gatekeepers of 38th in Chicago. Do you think that in some way th they, and I hate trying to side with them in any way, but do you think they intentionally decided not to attempt to reopen this until after the trial is over? Who's they? The, the, the mayor and the city council. Well, remember it was gonna be opened and then they did not have the willpower to bring that about. So then they said, well, we'll open it after the trial. I have no, evidence to believe it'll be opened after the trial. Okay. I believe again that in the hands of these adult children who run the city, they they apparently are okay with the idea that there is a, a lawless square block and that what takes place there is none of our business. Yeah. Up to apparently and including murder. God knows what else is going on there. We'll draw your own conclusion. And the, the I said last week, late last week, the, the Star Tribune is proving to be, to me anyway, proving to be terribly disappointing in the way they're handling this story. Not, not the whole story, the whole story. But let's just take the murder at 38th in Chicago. That's a front page story. Mm -hmm. That's a front page story 
it should be from the state's leading newspaper that should be a front page story that essentially says lawlessness has reached the point now where there is murder at 38th in Chicago and the police were interfered with, which is a euphemism for saying that the police apparently uh, might have gained access, let's say. Let's mm -hmm. say the police might have gained access to, uh, to uh, maybe they were granted permission to enter past the barricade. Jeez. Okay, what, what, they, what they then were uh, confronted with was com the complete absence of information. Maybe they were in there and they asked questions and everyone clammed up and miraculously shell casings were missing. Uh, they, they had nothing to go on. They weren't met with interference, meaning if they did get in, it sounds like a reasonable thing to conclude would be that no one in there talked to them about this shooting. All right, I think I found it. This is from August 9th of 2020, and this is that's a, about right. This yep. is a Care 11 story with the title: "Before 38th in Chicago reopens, some residents have a list of demands for the city." There's three names involved in this. Uh, the first is uh, Marsha Howard. That who, rings a bell. Who says, "Quote: yeah. As long as we occupy that space, we're in control." Uh, yeah. There is another quote by a local resident uh, of the name Janelle Austin. We won't no. quote. Quote, we want to be able to speak to the mayor and we want the mayor to actually take seriously all requests which are actionable. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember reading a list of the demands. Yeah, and, and that's mm -hmm. listed here as well. Uh, I think it's Marsha Howard is the name we were looking for. Yes. An investment in jobs in this neighborhood and independent prosecution of police who are involved in shooting of civilians, killing of civ and killing of civilians, said Howard. Mm hmm. Oh, they, I think they wanted some the, money, uh, too. Yeah, they did. Did you see the witness shot video of the shooting when that happened? That's been released um, on a few websites here in town. Did you are see you that? Talking, are you talking the one Saturday night? Yeah. I have not seen it. No. It's, uh, it, it's pretty stark to know that this happened, I mean, within feet of where the roses, uh, the bed of roses and the little fenced off area is, uh, you know, from when Floyd and uh, Chauvin had their interaction there when he was killed. It's it's just, it's incredible. It's wild. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> What's incredible is the precedent this is establishing. Uh, I, why should we have confidence? And we've we've discussed this. Why should we have confidence that five, six, seven, eight square blocks of Minneapolis will not be a carbon copy of 38th in Chicago? As the summer plays out, the trial drags on. What evidence do we have that that won't happen? Because what we do know is. There is no political will, there might be law enforcement will, but there's no political will to prevent that from happening. This is Andrea Jenkins Ward, where 38th in Chicago is. There's but not been one word from her or any city council member or the mayor on the murder of this fellow at 6 p.m. Saturday night in broad daylight at 38th in Chicago and the, and the, and the city's own police force is not allowed to investigate. There hasn't been a word from the mayor or the city council people. It's embarrassing. Well, it's it's unheard of. This is a major American city that is allowing lawlessness. The police are doing what they can. And 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 for the people who support what's taking place inside this so-called autonomous zone at 38th in Chicago, they should be very grateful to the police. I mean, that's, that's oxymoronic right. because you need the police to solve this, but the police are acquiescing to you people in there making your demands. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I, again, I continue to be uh, concerned that uh, it's going to be a long, hot summer. Mm. It, it's you know what you know what happens to too much time passes for let's say Andrea Jenkins came to her senses and suddenly developed a spine 
and went over to 38th in Chicago with a bullhorn and said, this is it. I represent this area. You people have had enough. It's too lawless. It's We're, we're, we're reopening, and I don't care what you think about it. Well, A, she's not going to do that. And B, she's waited so long that her, her words now would have no meaning. No, none. Right. None whatsoever. Right. And if she were to do that, think of the type of uh, assistance that she would need. In right. other words, you know, she's going to need at least, what, six officers go with her and who knows what else? Probably the National Guard. I think she was among the council members who early on uh, had the taxpayers foot the bill for her private security. That's, That's right. right. Yep. Oh, yeah. If the town had any spine at all, the mayor and all of the council members would be down there as the barricades were coming down. All yep. of them would be and, standing there, and every single on, one of them. Not only are they not down there, and apparently are not going to be down there, not one word about a murder there Saturday night. Yeah, they don't acknowledge that. No, not at all. <clears throat> and this, is, this historically is where newspapers step forward to champion their town. And by championing their town, the Star Tribune, in my estimation, needs to take a far more active role in revealing the dangers of what can happen when the political class allows a square block to be taken over by the unelected, up to and including, as we now know, murder. And I think it's the absence of that kind of coverage in the Star Tribune, which remains an influential paper. It's the absence of that kind of coverage that is aiding and abetting the lawlessness. It, if it's seen as the norm and it's just going to be ignored, then how can this not continue right, to be improve. the norm? It won't improve. How can this not continue to be the norm? Do you want the new normal in your city to be there are certain areas where anything can happen to you at all and the police will never get to the bottom of it? That's things of movies. That's Hollywood. It doesn't happen in real life. That's, <laughs> that's in the Joe, it's countries. not just... It's not just 38th and Chicago that's seeing that lack of response or no response at all from the police. It's all over Minneapolis. We have a mutual friend who owns a duplex down by Minnehaha Falls, and uh, they had to chase away an intruder that was breaking into one of the units. Cops never came, didn't show up. Do, do you know why? I mean, well, were yeah, they called? Why, were they called? Oh, yeah, they were called. Uh, but, yeah, we know why. They're too damn busy. There's yeah. not enough cops. Right. Right. <laughs> you know. And when we have a catch and release program. Right. The, Doesn't the, matter. The cops He's got nine prior convictions. Right. We had the story, was it two weeks ago, of the guy that had nine felony convictions. And he was out with no bail. Oh, the guy that kept robbing the, uh, what's the, what's uh, the, the saloon gnome. on Selby? The gnome. The, the gnome. The gnome. Happy gnome. The gnome. That's the one Carter blamed to the pandemic when it turns yeah. out it was a 54-year-old career criminal. It right. had nothing to do with the pandemic. Well, right. Joe, he's hungry because of the pandemic. Right, right. No, he's right. hungry because he's a thief. There is, there is in the Twin Cities, a segment of the population who, and I, I believe they're sincere, who sincerely believe that the people occupying 38th in Chicago are aggrieved, uh, deserve this occupation as a means of hoping to end what they're aggrieved about, which they believe to be their mistreatment at the hands of police. There is a segment of the Twin Cities population who understands that and, and believes it. I don't know how they can justify, however, a murder, which has nothing to do with being aggrieved, has nothing to do with treatment by police. It, it's an outgrowth of the lawlessness that is compelled by the very fact you let the whole area get out of hand now for one year. Yeah, there's no turning back. 
And I don't for a minute believe that will be reopened after the trial. I do not believe that. I'll, I'll eat my hat if I'm wrong, but I, I just don't see it. I just don't see how that can be reopened. Don't eat your hat. Just have a red yeah, boy. Yeah, that's, that's pretty drastic. A